Amen. Well, we are currently walking through the, uh, the Old Testament book of Nehemiah, really a journal, and we're kind of following uh, Nehemiah. We're following his story and uh, how God had uh, touched his life, put a burden uh, on his heart for a project, rebuilding the walls in the city of Jerusalem that had been broken down uh, some 70 plus years earlier when uh, out of God's judgment because of uh, the people of Israel had turned their back on God for years and years and years. He allowed them to be open to their enemies and, and King Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon had come in. They had attacked the city. They destroyed the walls. They just burned down the gates. They destroyed the temple and they took the people captive back to Babylon. And you might remember some people by the name of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were some of the exiles that were taken, but there were others as well. And uh, that was just for a period of time. God had always promised that he was going going to release his people to come back and, and to rebuild. That was his promise, his covenant promise to Abraham, uh, that that land would be their land, that they would, that, that, that he had promised that to them. And there would always be a king in his covenant to David. There would always be a king on the throne and God keeping with his promises through Cyrus, after the Babylonian Empire had fallen to the Medo-Persian Empire, uh, a ruler by the name of Cyrus had come, and Cyrus released the captives uh, to begin to go back. And uh, they, in, in several waves, they began to go back, and they they rebuilt the temple, but the walls and the gates had 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 not been rebuilt. In fact, there was opposition. And the very king that Nehemiah served as cupbearer, Artaxerxes, was the very one who they had petitioned to say, this is a, a wicked and rebellious city. They're not going to pay taxes to you. If you let them rebuild, don't let them rebuild. He stopped all the work. And so the very one that Nehemiah had worked for had stopped the work. And Nehemiah's brother had come and let him know that the city was in reproach. And the walls had been broken down and the gates had been burned with fire. And it burdened Nehemiah so much that as we talked about over the last few weeks, he, he went into a season of prayer and fasting. And after 100 plus days, God opened up, as we looked at last week, the opportunity for him in the waiting to be able to prepare and to be able to pray into the vision that God had given him and, and opened up the opportunity for him to share the need with King Artaxerxes. And he does. And in God's favor, Artaxerxes says, well, what do you want to do? And so he shares that God had put it on his heart that he said, yes, God, send me. I want to go back and I want to rebuild. And God opened up a window of opportunity for him after a season of prayer. And Nehemiah said, here am I. I'm willing. Send me. And, uh, and he was willing. And he asked for protection in his travels. And he asked for a, a letter to the king's forest for the supplies that they needed. And so as we begin today... We're going to start at the place where Nehemiah has made a journey, about a, uh, about a three and a half month journey. They had to go uh, on foot, a little bit on horseback, but it took a while for them to get what they needed and to, 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 to leave from where they were in the region or the area of Susa to go all the way back to Jerusalem. And so we're going to pick up our story in Nehemiah chapter 2. And so if you turn with me to Nehemiah chapter Chapter two. That's where we're going to begin today. And again, uh, it's going to be on your screen as well. We're going to start in verse 11. Nehemiah chapter two, starting in verse 11. Now, as we begin, uh, I, I, I want to clear up or I want to make kind of make clear why walls are important. Why were the walls and the gates such an important thing? Why did it bother Nehemiah? And why was that a reflection of reproach uh, 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 upon the, the, the people of Jerusalem? Why would the walls being burned down bother Nehemiah so much that he would be willing to leave his cushy job in the king's presence in the palace, eating the best food and drinking the best wine, making sure it was safe for the king and having the influence? Why would would he take a risk and be willing to leave that behind to endure the hard work of rebuilding? What was it about walls? I think in our political day and age, there's a lot of uh, things that might be associated with wall building. Okay, I didn't get the laugh I thought it might. That's okay. Still a little touchy. I understand as we go into another political year. That's okay. 
Now, oftentimes when we think about walls, we think of walls as obstacles. Uh, we, we think of walls in terms of opposition. Uh, perhaps we talk about, you know, the, the, you know, I'm just keep hitting this wall and this wall needs to come down. Or some of you get in a conversation, maybe it's with your boss, sometimes it's with your spouse. And you say, man, I just feel like I'm talking to a wall. You know what I'm talking about? Walls tend to have negative con con context to them. We, we want to see walls come down, the Berlin Wall. Hey, communism, come down. And we want to see walls come down. So with walls come down, why would Nehemiah want to put walls up? That doesn't seem to make sense. Walls kind of this idea of breakthrough, right? Spiritual breakthrough. The walls of Jericho, where they were in the way of them receiving the promise of God. And so they had to march around the walls and lift up a shout of praise. And the walls came a-tumbling down. Come on, somebody. We love when the walls come a-tumbling down. <laughs> right? But, it, but in, 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 the, in the book of Nehemiah, we're not talking about tearing down walls. We're talking about putting up walls. And so what I want to, what I want to do is kind of clear up this idea because this idea of putting up walls is, is, is not about putting up these, these kind of barriers that, that create a lack of, of openness or, 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 or something like that. They're not associated with that. There's some spiritual truth to be gained in walls being torn down. However, in ancient cities, particularly in the Old Testament, walls not only represented protection, but they represented the strength of the people and they represented the strength of the God that they served. There, were, there, were not, there was not artillery and there was not the kind of armies and the, and, and the kind of defense systems that we have, uh, that, that we have today. In fact, to protect against uh, invaders, and, and oftentimes this is kind of the way it went. The strength of your God was associated with the power of your army and the ability for you to take hold of territory. And when you would win a battle, you would win a battle in the name of your God, whatever it was. Again, if you look in the Old Testament and ancient cultures, there are no atheists. Everybody believed in some kind of God or goddess. They believed in some kind of spiritual power or power, so to speak, or gods that would give them either a uh, blessing upon their produce or agriculture or blessing upon their ability to, to be able to have a family and, 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 and have, a, have that, that fertility that ability for, for them to be able to grow in that way in their families or, or, or again, the might and strength of their armies. And so there was, there was battles taking place all the time in ancient civilizations over particular territories. And so these walls represented not only the, the strength of the people, but represented the strength of their God. Nebuchadnezzar built walls around the capital city of Babylon. In fact, the ancient Greek historian Herodotus said that, that they were 80 feet thick and that chariot races took place on top of the walls as people would kind of be down and they would watch the chariot races around the tops of the walls from the city below. A city with no walls had little hope of holding off an army that came against them. So while spiritually speaking, some walls do need to come down to allow us to move forward in victory. There are also some, some benefits to having spiritual protection in our lives. To remain strengthened against spiritual attack. In fact, Proverbs 4.23 says, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Right? In the New Testament, Paul uses the analogy of the armor of God, putting on the full armor of God. Why? To stave off and to protect with the shield of faith the fiery darts of the evil one. So when our spiritual walls are in disrepair, our lives are open to spiritual attack from the enemy. Our families are open to spiritual attack from the enemy. Our church is open to spiritual attack from the enemy. Our community is open to spiritual attack from the enemy. Our nation is open to spiritual attack from the enemy when our spiritual walls start to crumble and start to fall. When the gates what we allow in and out of our lives are in disrepair or burn with fire. It opens up the opportunity for things that shouldn't get in our heart and get in our spirit to get in. Am I making sense? 
At this point in the story, again, Nehemiah received approval from King Artaxerxes. He traveled to Jerusalem to rebuild the walls, taking about two to three months to be able to get there. It's probably been about six months since he had gotten the word from his brother, and then about 100 days or so, a little over three months before the opportunity and the window opened, and then the opportunity to get things ready and to travel uh, to Jerusalem. And that's where we find our story today, starting in Nehemiah 2, verse 11. I went to Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few others. I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on. So what does Nehemiah do? Nehemiah arrives in the city and, and he waits three days before doing anything else. Why? After so much time did he get there? Why? When he got there, didn't he just get going? Why didn't he just get started? I, I, was, I was wondering this particular question. <clears throat> Some theologians have, ha, 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 that have written about this or studied this have, have different takes on it. Some think that when he came with an army from the king and his position as cupbearer and those kind of things, that people were kind of, what is this delegation that is showing up here? What's it all about? And so they went into their, their ancient uh, customs of, of hospitality and they began to have dinners to celebrate as they wanted to try to figure out, why are you here? What are you doing? What is this all about? And so after uh, three days of celebration, finally one, one night, Nehemiah gets a break and he says, this is our break. Let's go check out what's happening. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's one possibility. The other possibility that people say is after that long of a trip, he needed a couple days to rest before he could have an accurate assessment of what was, what was happening and the damages that were happening. We don't exactly know why he waited three days. We don't know exactly what's happening. But what we find in the next several verses from verse 11 all the way down to verse 20 is kind of a template for how we begin the work. So God put the work on his heart, opened up the window for him to be able to share, got approval for the opportunity. Now it's time to begin. And I think what we see in this next part is, is kind of some key key pieces in a template that when, when you are looking to rebuild your life, maybe it's your life personally, spiritually, maybe there's some things in your home and you're looking to to kind of get some things back on track and rebuild some things in your home or, 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 or your family or maybe some things here in the church or, or community, whatever it is, I think Nehemiah gives us a little bit of a template of how we ought to begin. How do we, how do we begin? So the template here is for beginning the work of rebuilding and he begins with this inspection. Inspection. Nehemiah 2, 13 to 16, there were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on. By night, I went through the valley gate toward the jackal, gate, jackal well and the dung gate. That sounds like a wonderful place. Examining the wall of Jerusalem, which had been broken down and its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. Then I moved toward the fountain gate and the king's pool, but there was not enough room for my mount to get through. So I went up the valley by night, examining the wall. Finally, I turned back and re-entered the valley gate. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing because I had, as yet, I had said nothing to the Jews or the priests or the nobles or the officials or any others who would be doing the work. So Nehemiah, rather than just entering in and saying, well, we're here, let's get to work, we're going to rebuild these walls, Nehemiah pauses for a moment and stops and says, you know what? Before we begin the work, we need to do a proper inspection. We need to do a proper investigation. We need to do a proper inspection. We need to take an honest look at the damage. What Nehemiah did not want to do was presume to understand and to know just how bad things were or, or just where the work was simply by what he had been told by his brother six months earlier. He said, whoa, 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 I've got to see it for myself. I've got to take time to see it for myself. I've heard about it, but I've not seen it. So in the cover of night, to, to not incur any kind of questions, and he didn't share the need because he didn't want to hear everybody else's opinion on it. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Right? Sometimes you can see a problem, 
And, and, and if you share that problem with someone else, depending on who they are, they might say, oh, it's not that bad. Oh, I don't know. I don't think we need to. Do you really have to go that far? Do we really need to? Do we? Do, I, I don't know if it's that bad. You know, I mean, we've been trying here and there's a few things here and there's a few things that and, and kind of get your perspective in a certain direction. And I think that's what that's that's what can happen. Nehemiah says, no, 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 I'm just going to take a few other people with me and we're going to go and we're going to take a look and we're going to inspect the damage ourselves. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to inspect the damage. Then I'll have better idea. I've had a plan, but now I need a better idea of what that ought to look like. And that doesn't happen unless we inspect. How many know that there are some problems that, that look behavioral on the outside when we're dealing with some things spiritually, they look like some things we've got to take care of from a behavioral standpoint on the outside. But I think that sometimes the behavior on the outside is really a reflection of something that's broken down deep inside. Not everything is the way it appears. There are sometimes some choices that we make or there are sometimes some things that come in our outward behavior that are really the result of some things that are really broken down deep on the inside. And the only way you get to really figuring out what the true problems are is when you get past just what you see on the outside and you begin to allow the Holy Spirit to do a careful inspection of what the problem is on the inside. What's, what's happening down deep, right? See, what if the behavior is a reflection of damage that runs much deeper? What if the attitudes are due to damage of, of, uh, or thinking that is incorrect or incorrect judgment or perception? There's, there's a good chance that, that the need for restoration is something that takes a little bit more time to truly do a proper inspection to say, what is really the problem? What is really going on? What's really happening here? I think at the beginning of the year, oftentimes we make New Year's resolutions and, and we want to start out and we want and we start out like gangbusters trying to do some things on the outside, but really we haven't addressed some problems that happen underneath that really oftentimes hinder us from the changes we want to make or the things we want to see. And that only happens with proper inspection. In fact, in verse 13 and again in verse 15, when Nehemiah uses the word inspected the walls and the gates, he uses a, a very specific Hebrew word that, that means to look into something very carefully. In fact, the term is also used in, in, in the medical way, that it's a medical word for probing a wound to see the extent of the damage. Probing a wound to see the extent of the damage. To find out where the infection lies and how deep it goes. That's the kind of inspection we need in our hearts. Nehemiah was probing a very deep wound that just didn't affect him, but affected others who were there in the area. But most importantly, it was something that had brought reproach on the name of the Lord his God. It had brought reproach on God and the strength of God. And in firsthand understanding the, the nature of the damages required a proper inspection. I don't know about you. Does anybody like those house flipping shows on HGTV or Magnolia Network, right? I love me some Chip and Joanna Gaines sometimes, right? <laughs> shiplap. <laughs> Come on, somebody. <laughs> you got to like that shiplap, right? Yeah. But, but I, you know, some of these shows are, you, you know, some of these ones that you, you watch, you, you find out that sometimes, you know, they bought this place. They had all these dreams for these place. And then as they get into tearing things out and they, and they get in, all of a sudden they begin to uncover some things that they hadn't seen before. You know what I'm talking about? In fact, there's one show called Fix My Flip in which this uh, expert, Paige Turner, she oftentimes will receive calls from, from average amateur people in the house flipping type business that have all of these dreams. They've seen the TV shows. They, 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 they buy this particular property. We're going to turn it around in a quick period of time. We're gonna, and then they get themselves in over their head. They're over their budget. They, they, they don't know what they're doing. They can't figure it out. They uncover some things they shouldn't, and they call her, and she has to come in and try to help them fix it. I think there are times that's what we do. 
we want to go in. We see some things that need to be fixed in our lives. We see some things that need to be fixed in our homes, things that need to be fixed in our marriage, things that need to be fixed in, in, in our community or in our church or, or in our nation. And, and, and we just want to go rush right in and, and let's get, and then all of a sudden it gets overwhelmed because we start poking around or we start getting into it. We realize, oh my goodness, there are some things that I didn't realize. I don't know if I want to uncover that. Ouch, that hurts. That's a wound down. Eey, I don't know if I want to touch that. What do you mean? Ooh, we got to go there. <laughs> Careful inspection. Careful inspection. Jesus said this in Luke 14, 28 and 29. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if we have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish what everyone will, who sees it will ridicule you. In other words, what's Jesus saying? You've got to count the cost. You've got to count the cost. And so before you begin, it's important to sit down and inspect the the damage. David cried out in Psalm 139, 23 and 24, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. David said, oh Lord God, search me. Search my heart. Do an inspection in me. Do an inspection in me. Nehemiah takes time to carefully inspect the damages and count the cost and plan accordingly before he ever shared the vision, shared the need, or began a stitch of work. He said, I've got to inspect. I've got to see what's going on. Secondly, the, what, what Nehemiah does here to show us when we're, when we're in any kind of a rebuilding process is cooperation. Cooperation. Nehemiah 2.17, then I said to them, you see the trouble we're in? Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. Now, after careful inspection, Nehemiah says, you know what? We can't, I can't do this job alone. I didn't come here with these soldiers to do it for you. Let's do it together. Let's rebuild the walls together. Let's rebuild the gates together. It takes cooperation. It takes cooperation. Nehemiah understands the power of partnership and also the power of we. Did, did you see what he said here? He said, you see the trouble we are in. Nehemiah was an outsider. He, he had a cushy job in the king's palace. He, this, 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 wasn't, this wasn't his trouble. He didn't live there. He wasn't sitting there. He wasn't in. He had seen the trouble, but he, he wasn't in the trouble. But he says, the trouble we are in. Come let us Right? Rebuild the wall. of, And we will no longer be in disgrace. In other words, I'm right in here with you. I'm in here with you. I'm not saying it's your fault. You haven't rebuilt this city. You didn't press through. You didn't do what you needed to do. Oh, it was our ancestors. They brought disgrace on this. We are in disgrace. That's ownership. It's ownership. And it's also the ability to say, we need cooperation. We've got to do this thing together. We are in trouble experiencing disgrace and trouble. In fact, the first evidence of cooperation is that he didn't do the inspection alone, but he brought a, a smaller group with him to also do that, to be able to have others who could, who could see and point out things and say, well, what about this? Hey, did you see this? How many know that, that sometimes our own perspective doesn't give us the full picture of what's happening, right? You need to bring others you trust. Others you trust along in the journey and you, you, you gotta, you gotta say, listen, will, will you join me in the work? When it comes to any kind of rebuilding effort, whether it's rebuilding your life spiritually or repairing damages to your marriage or your family or your home or, or ministry or church or community, friends, I've just gotta be honest with you. It's just not anything you can do alone. You can't do it alone. You need the help of a counselor sometimes. You need the help of a coach. You need the help of a mentor. You need to join a life group so you can have a group of people that'll walk life together, that encourage you and pick you up when you stumble or when you're down, that'll pray with you when you're struggling, and that'll hold you accountable to, to, to what you say you're going to do. We, we need cooperation. 
the, 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 this whole thing that we're going to see as we move forward in this in chapter 3 and beyond, you're going to see the power of partnership and the power of cooperation when it comes to any kind of a rebuilding effort. Solomon put it this way in Ecclesiastes 4, 9, and 10. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up, but pity the one who falls and has no one to help them up. When it comes to life in general, two are better than one. When it comes to life in general, surrounding yourself with others that you can trust is crucial to any kind of work that God puts in your heart to do. Any kind of work that God puts in your heart to do. Third is inspiration. Inspiration. So we have inspection, cooperation, but Nehemiah needs to bring a little inspiration. He needs to bring a little inspiration to this group. And so in Nehemiah 2.18, he says, I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. And they replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. Nehemiah brought some inspiration. You might remember that last week I talked about the fact that, that, that there was some apathy that had taken place. There was, there was a sense of, of becoming comfortable with the way things were. How many know that we can get comfortable with the way things are? That, that sometimes you can, you can begin to, to get comfortable with the damages around you and you can begin to see it as normal. You can begin to see that, that, that some of the pain that you live with every day, all of a sudden you become a little bit numb to it and, and you say, well, <laughs> this is just the way it is. The problems in, in your marriage, or the problems in your family or the, the struggles and the, the things that you have, you stop battling and you just start giving in and, and you say, well, you know what? I've gone to the altar. I prayed about that before, but I haven't received any victory. It just kind of thing. And you can find yourself growing comfortable and apathetic with the damages and the pain and the hardship and the brokenness. It's easy to find ourselves comfortable and then we no longer recognize, we no longer recognize recognize it, or we find ourselves in a place of defeat where we just feel defeated. Well, we tried that before. We faced opposition. The king said we weren't allowed to build anymore. So that's just what it is. This is just the way we live. The walls are broken down. The gates are burned with fire. We just live in reproach. This is just the way it is. And so what does Nehemiah do? Nehemiah says, listen, I've inspected the walls and I think it's time for us to rebuild. I, I, I've inspected, I, I've taken a look. I need your help to be able to do that. But before moving forward, Nehemiah said, hold on a second. Let me tell you what God has done. Let me tell you what God has done. I heard the need. I prayed into the need. I began to pray into this need. I was far away from you. I wasn't here. You're right. I wasn't living in it, but my brother told me about it and I couldn't stay there king's palace anymore. I couldn't stay there as the cupbearer in his presence day in and day out while you all are here in reproach. We are in reproach. I'm in this with you. And you know what? I've come here because God put this in my heart to do. And let me tell you what happened. Let me tell you what happened as I prayed into that, that very king who had stopped the work asked me why I was so upset. And rather than put me in jail, rather than, 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 than lock me up, he said, he said, he said, so what do you want me to do? And so I just I threw up a prayer. I said, okay, God, here's what I want you to, here's what I want, king. I, 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 I want to go back and rebuild the place where, where my ancestors lies in ruins. The gates have been burned with fire, the walls. I want to go back and rebuild. I, I, I want to go back and you know what? I need protection and you know what? I need some supplies. And the king said, yes. And he sent me with this delegation and he said, yes, the gracious hand of God was upon me. Come on, let's rebuild. Right? Man, some of you are ready to rebuild after that. Inspiration, right? Inspiration. He declares both the favor of God, the gracious hand was upon me, and the favor of man. That is, that the authorities who were in place at that time holding things up, God opened the door for their favor as well. Sometimes you need just the favor of God. Sometimes you need something happening where you get the favor of man to say, you know what? We're going to sign off on that. We're going to open up that. All of a sudden, you're running into that wall, and that wall is what falls down as you begin to say, we got some work to do. We got some work to do. These testimonies inspired the people to say, let's start rebuilding. 
Sometimes the hardest part of rebuilding is getting motivated. You know what I'm saying? The damages just seem overwhelming. The, the cost just seems too much. The, the, the upward climb, we've tried this before and it's failed. We just under this sense of, man, I just have no, no victory. There's just, I can't seem to get victory. Sometimes the hardest place to, 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 with starting is the motivation to get started. And that's where the testimonies come in. That's where the testimonies come in. Sometimes you got to borrow faith from someone else. Sometimes you got to borrow faith from somebody else. Sometimes you got to, you got to take a look and listen to somebody else's testimony of how God radically saved them, about, about how God radically healed them, about how God radically delivered them, about how God provided for them when they had nothing, about how God opened up a door when there was no door, when they were out of work and they were out of work, they were out of work and they had absolutely, they were down to their last dime, but all of a sudden they saw the gracious hand of God provide and they said my God will provide and you're in that situation you go I don't know I don't know I mean I'm just under a mound of debt I just don't know how I'm gonna get out of this and somebody says listen you got to start tithing because I started tithing and look what happened God and you suddenly get motivated to start obeying the Lord and have faith in God and trusting him sometimes you're under it you get the doctor's reports and you say Man, I don't know where we're going. I don't know how this, this, this healing is going to come. I, I don't see how this can come. But you hear about somebody else and God healed them. God moved in their life. God did the impossible with them. And you go, Lord, will you do it for me? And all of a sudden it motivates you. A little bit of motivation. Those testimonies, you say, man, I think our marriage is just, I don't think it's ever, I, don't, I, I just don't see how we're going to work through this. But then you hear the testimony of someone else. Who says, you know what, we were, we were, we were apart, we were, we were on the verge of divorce, we, were, we, were, we just didn't even know. I, but, but you know what, we began to pray, and I began to pray for my marriage, and then God began to do some things, and we, we began to get some counseling, we began to get some healing, we began to learn some different ways to communicate, and different ways to relate, and it took a while. It was not an overnight thing, it took a while, but we started putting in the work, and God, God stirred up the, the fires of love back, the, the things that we no longer felt anymore, we suddenly started to feel again. Why? Because, because God started to stir it in us, and what God did for us, he can do for you. Come on, inspiration, inspiration, inspiration. David wanted to fight Goliath, man. He, he had come up upon an army that, that every day Goliath stood in front of them. And every day Goliath said, who's going to come out and march against me? And everybody would run in fear and cower. And all of a sudden, this little guy, David, shows up. He'd been out in the field. He was just a shepherd. He, goes out, he comes up. He's just supposed to see and check on his brothers. His daddy sends him. And he hears this guy, Goliath, and all of a sudden, David is like, I'll fight him. Who's going to fight him? Why are you all afraid? We serve the army of the living God, right? Why are you all afraid of this guy? Our God is bigger. And they're like, shut up. You're just, you're just out here. You're, David, be quiet. You're just some little guy. Look at you all puffed up with pride. You come out here. That's his brother. He's about like, you're just puffed up with pride. You just think you can do And he goes, ah, I'm not listening to you. And he shut off that voice. And he talks to him. Finally gets an audience with King Saul. And King Saul looks at him and King Saul says, who are you? You're just a little boy. You're, you're not a fighting man. And David says this, the God who rescued me from the paw of the lion, or that rescued me from the, from the lion, rescued me from the paw of the bear, that, that same God will rescue me from this. The army of the living God. And it was a testimony. This is what God has done. And, and, and David had motivation. And David had inspiration when everybody else was defeated day in and day out by the voices of the giants. By the voices of the giants saying, no, you can't. No, you can't. No, you can't. I'm bigger than you. I'm stronger than you. It's too much for you. You can't. And David said, oh, no, 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 no. There was a lion that was bigger than me. But I gra God gave me the power and I grabbed it by its mane and that was it. There was a bear that came at me. But you know what? I, God gave me the power to protect my sheep. And it's God who does it. And it's God who will give me victory over this giant. It's God who will give me. And, and David's act of faith inspired the rest of the Israelite army. It inspired the rest of the Israelite army. Sometimes you need a little inspiration. An inspiration. Third, fourthly, you need a little determination. <laughs> this is the last one. You need a little determination. Here we come. Verse 19. Because you know it couldn't be that easy, right? Right? I just stirred you all up. It's never that easy. But when Sanballat, the Hornite, 
And Tobiah, the Ammonite official, and Geshem, the Arab, heard about it. They mocked and ridiculed us. What is this you're doing, they asked. Are you rebelling against the king? I answered them by saying, the God of heaven will give me success. We as servants will start rebuilding. But as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. So immediately he starts to inspire the people. They say, let us build. And here it comes. Here comes the opposition. Because the moment you start doing something for God, the enemy is going to start coming against you. The moment you start doing something for God, whether you say, you know what, I got to rebuild some spiritual habits in my life. I've got to rebuild in, in my life. I am broken and I need to rebuild my life spiritually and I need to take some steps to begin to, 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 to rebuild in my life or my home or my marriage or my church or my community. I'm going to tell you, the moment you start to do what God inspires you to do is the moment the enemy starts to come with his lies with his lies. He says to Nehemiah, you, you're rebelling. You're rebelling against the king. You're the king's servant. You're Nehemiah knows the truth. No, we're not rebelling against the king. Nice try. Nice try. Nice try. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what? You, you guys, you, 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 what are you trying to do, you silly people? They mocked and they ridiculed. And, and you're going to see the opposition is going to continue in, in chapter 3 and, and, and beyond. You're going to see the opposition and, and the distractions and the things that, that try to come. Because they do. As you continue the work, they do. That's why it takes determination. This is not a, this is not your, sometimes we start but we don't finish. And why? Because sometimes we get weary in the battle. We get weary when the enemy attacks. We get weary when the enemy comes against us. It takes a little bit of determination. Well, who were these men who, who sat opposing the wall to be rebuilt? Why? What was their, what was their motivation? Well, Sambalot was the governor of Samaria, which was to the north. His name was actually a Babylonian name, which could have been that he was someone that when the exiles were taken out, was someone that was sent back in to replace so that the the land wouldn't be damaged to kind of rule over an area. And in Samaria, Jerusalem would have been a part of his territory at that time. Therefore, when Nehemiah, the cupbearer to the king, shows up with some of the soldiers and some of the men from the king, he saw it as a political threat to his, to his standing, right? To his position. This, this other guy uh, who's here, Tobiah, he ruled the Ammonites in the east. His, he, he has a Hebrew name indicating that he, he possibly had some Jewish roots. And maybe for himself, he wondered why he wasn't chosen or wasn't allowed to be the one to rebuild. And when Nehemiah shows up and starts inspiring, he says, wait a minute, if I can't do the work, you can't either. Earlier, they had, you, you, you see in Ezra, in the book of Ezra, that there was a group that wanted to join with them. And they said, no, 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 you have no part in us. Nehemiah says the same thing. You have no, no part in us because their motives were not right. Their motives were not pure. They, they, they were not the ones that God had, had called. And their version of what was going to be or what should be would have taken the whole thing off track. He says, no, 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 no. You know, no, no, I'm not listening to you. And Geshem, he was just a leader of the Arabs to the south. And uh, he was just joining with the others because it strengthened his own political position. Because what they were really worried about was that the city of Jerusalem got rebuilt and the people really started serving God. That their power and their position was threatened. Always comes down to power and position, doesn't it? And, and, and so they mock, they ridiculed, they lied. Friends, people don't always have your best interest in mind. Can I just be honest with you? Not everybody has your best interest in mind. When, when something threatens to change in the relationship, change how you do the dance steps, change what you do, sometimes, sometimes uh, change causes people to react negatively even when what you're wanting to do is positive. Not everybody is able to see it. And the enemy of our soul does not want, a see, want to see us rebuild our lives or to step out in faith and do something that God has put in our hearts to do. You ought to expect opposition from the enemy. You ought to expect in the battle, you will face discouragement. You will face opposition. You will face difficulty. That's why it takes determination. 
you've got to be willing to say, God, I am not doing this work on my own. Notice where Nehemiah, notice what Nehemiah says, right? Look what he says to him. He says, the God of heaven will give us success. He doesn't say that we will have success because the foreign king said you can rebuild. He doesn't say because of Artaxerxes and because he gave us supplies from the king's, uh, the king's forest that we will be successful. No, the God of heaven will give us success. Listen, God is the one who gives us success. God is the one who allows us to be able to, to not only do the work, complete the work. God is the one who gives us the victory. Your faith is in God. It's not in you. It's not. In your abilities, it's not in the people that work with you. Your faith is in God. It's in God. And that's the key. Our faith is in God. The God of heaven himself will prosper us. This is what gives Nehemiah the determination and the focus to continue on. In times of my own personal discouragement... Times when I've run up against the discouragement because the enemy's good at discouraging the vision that God puts in your heart. There have been times where the work seems overwhelming. There have been times where, where the vision, I just don't, God, I don't know. I don't even see this is going to happen. I don't even, I don't even know. I remember the, a verse, Psalm 127.1. Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. Listen, listen, listen. It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. You've got to remember that in that rebuilding process, whatever the work is, whether it's personally in your life or whether it's in your family or in your marriage or whether it's some ministry that God has put on your heart, that, that unless the Lord does the work, unless the Lord builds the house, unless the Lord goes before you, unless the Lord is the one who does it, your, your labor is in vain. The Lord is the one. So when we stand against the opposition of the enemy, we don't do so in our own strength. But we say, the Lord is the one. So rebuilding takes determination. Leaning in and tuning out, leaning into God and tuning out the voices that we shouldn't be, we shouldn't be tuning into. Worship team, will you come? In order to begin the work of rebuilding your life, whether it's spiritually, your marriage, your family, your home, whether it is our church or doing some work to try to help rebuild some things in this community or our nation. It takes people who are willing to open up their hearts to the Holy Spirit and say, will you, will you do an inspection in me? Will you give me eyes to see? What do I need to see? Give me a, the ability to pause and, and let me see the things I need to see. Give me the eyes to see the things I need to see. Give me the discernment in my heart. Help me discern so that I can do a careful inspection of the brokenness and the damage that I'm dealing with. It means taking an honest look at our lives, an honest look at our marriage, an honest look at our families, our church, our community, inspecting the work that needs to be done. It, it means bringing others in to say, will you help me with this evaluation? People that you trust to say, you know, I've been struggling. Will you help me? Will you help me to be able to, to see what's happening? Asking for people's help. The work of rebuilding can't be done alone. Sometimes you need ministry partners. Sometimes you need counselors. Sometimes you need coaches. Sometimes you need mentors. Sometimes you need to bring someone else that you trust. Maybe you need the help of a small group or a life group or a group of friends. And you say, listen, this is what the Lord is putting on my heart. This is where I need to go. Will you help me? Will you join me in this journey? Will you join me? It means being determined. To verse, persevere regardless of the adversity, the opposition. To lean into the faithfulness and lean into the power of God. Remember what God has already done. Don't get discouraged. Don't get discouraged. So maybe this morning you need to say, Holy Spirit, will you begin to inspect my life? Will you come in right now? I open up and will you pray that prayer that David prayed? Search my heart. Search my heart and know me. Maybe you're in a place where you say, Lord, will you show me who needs, who, who needs to come alongside of me? Maybe, maybe I need a coach in my life or maybe I need a mentor in my life or maybe I need a counselor to help us or maybe I, I need some, someone in the body of Christ. Will you just say, who, who needs to cooperate? 
maybe you're struggling and you just need to borrow some faith and say, I need the testimony of others. What I'm going through, I just don't see how, but I need the motivation and the inspiration here to be able to get started. Or maybe you're just waning in determination. You're in the midst of the battle and you say, I just need the determination to continue going. Will you open up your heart to the Lord right now and say, Jesus, what do you need to do in me? What do you need to do in me? Father, that's our prayer today. Lord, do a careful inspection of our lives. Holy Spirit, right now, do a careful inspection of our hearts and our lives. I pray that you'd inspire faith in us. That you'd just allow us to see who can come with us in this journey. And that God, give us the perseverance and the determination to continue on with what you have called us to do. We just thank you, Lord, that we can lean into you. And that it's not our own strength, our own talent, our own abilities. But Lord, we lean into you for your power and your strength and your might. We give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.